So good news, we're doing the fun part now. So this is the part where you get to play around with your IOLAB sensor. So if you didn't know already, you are supposed to rent this from Macmillan Publisher to do the labs this semester. They send it to you, and then you should work through the steps on their website in order to install the program that you're going to use for data taking. That's what's showing on the left-hand side of my screen right now, and to calibrate your sensor. So assuming you've done all that, you're ready to start the experiment. So to begin with, I pop out the dongle, the Wi-Fi dongle for my sensor, and I plug that into my computer. And now I want to turn on the sensor with this button. Make sure that the lights are flashing. And we're actually going to flip this over and use it as a rolling cart. Now this experiment studies acceleration on an inclined. So I've got an artist pad here and I'm just using the back of it as my flat surface. And then I'm going to incline it later with a box. And I'll just be releasing my cart from the top of the pad and letting it slide down to the bottom. So you can do this experiment, say, on a book, or you can even tilt the entire table. The Wi-Fi on the sensor has a range of about 30 meters, so you can set up on a table or a patch of floor somewhere near your computer, and that should work fine. So you want to set up something that's going to give you an inclined plane like this, and you'll also want something to act as a backstop. So I've just got a box pressed against the wall here, but you could also use a heavy textbook or something. Now the first measurement we need to take is actually with a flat track, because what we want to do is get a grip on how much friction there is in the wheels of this cart. So we can measure that directly. Now I'm going to be rolling this cart and then taking some data based on what the wheels are doing. So down here at the bottom of the row of sensors, I click on wheel and I'm just going to leave it with position, velocity, and acceleration all showing. And that gives me three graphs, position, velocity, acceleration. So I click on the record button and then push this guy and let it just roll freely. Stop taking data. And then I want to zoom in on this information here. So if you go to the top, there's a little magnifying glass and you can click and drag to highlight just a small section of data that you're interested in. So it'll automatically resize the horizontal axis so that it's the same for all three graphs, but the vertical axis I've only zoomed in on this middle graph. So now I want to zoom in on the other two as well, just to see a little better what's going on with them. And so we've got the position graph up here, the velocity graph, and the acceleration graph. Now, if there was no friction in the wheels of this cart, then when it rolled, it would just roll forever. Nothing would slow it down until it hit something. And that would mean that this middle graph would be a completely flat line, constant velocity. However, we can see that there is a non-zero slope here. That's due to the friction in the wheels. That's what we want to measure. Now, to highlight some data so that you can get some statistics on the motion, you click on this little histogram button up here at the top. And by the way, I always forget to do that, and I'll try to highlight my data and accidentally zoom in again. If you do that by accident, just click once, and it'll undo your last zoom. So we don't zoom in anymore. We click instead on the histogram button, and now we can click and drag to highlight some of our data. Now over here, it gives me the average of all of this data, and right next to it, it gives the uncertainty of that average. We will occasionally use this, but what we actually are interested in on this graph is the slope of it. So over here, they give us the slope, but they don't give us an uncertainty on it. So it's actually better to get the acceleration down here from the acceleration graph. So I'm going to highlight just the area where the cart was rolling, and the acceleration looks roughly constant, and then this average is the value I want. So this is the acceleration due to friction, and its uncertainty is listed right beside it. Now that's the first item of data that you want to take for this experiment. So if you haven't done so already, start preparing your lab notebook, write down the title, the date, your name, the objective, and the apparatus procedure section, and then you can start filling in your data section. And this will be your first value, the acceleration due to friction of the cart's wheels. So the next things that we're going to study are all on the track itself. We won't be using the program, so I'm going to zoom in on just the track now. So now we're ready to tilt the track. So I'll prop up this end of the track with my box. And we need to take some measurements off of this. So we are going to be doing experimental measurements of what the acceleration of this cart is on the inclined track. But we're also going to calculate theoretically what that acceleration should be in four different ways. This is so that we can compare the different acceleration values to see whether they agree well within their limits of uncertainty. 
Now, the first theoretical calculation we're going to do is based on a free body diagram, assuming that there is no friction. We, of course, measured the friction on the track, and we're going to subtract that off. But the original free body diagram won't include it. Now, if you look in the lab manual, it explains the theory. That first equation, using the free body diagram, finds that the acceleration of the cart without friction would be g, the acceleration due to gravity, times sine theta, where theta is the angle of this track. And of course, sine theta is equal to opposite over hypotenuse, so we can measure the height of the track here at this edge and the length of the track and substitute it into our equation instead of sine theta. So that means that our equation simplifies down just to g times h divided by l, the length of the track. And by the way, keep in mind that the length of the track here is not the same thing as the distance that the cart traveled. So I'm going to release my cart from up here into the track, and it stops down here, which means that the cart actually traveled from here to here. So that's shorter than this length here. So capital D is the distance that the cart traveled, and L is the length of the track itself. So let's measure the height of the track and the length of the track and the D value, and also think about the uncertainties for those values. So to measure the height on this end, I'd line up my ruler and take a measurement, and then I'd go over here and take another measurement over here, and one minus the other should give me the elevation of this end of the track. Now there's one wrinkle here, and that is that my ruler actually doesn't start zero right at the end of the plastic. So there's like an extra three millimeters here. That's actually not going to be a problem for this particular measurement because we're subtracting one value minus the other. So if this measurement is about three millimeters too big, this one will be as well. And when I subtract this from this, that three millimeters will disappear. So it's actually not an issue. But let's think about uncertainties. So what kind of uncertainty are we going to have on taking this measurement? Well, anytime you take a measurement with a ruler, Generally speaking, you'll have two reading uncertainties, one for taking the measurement and a second one for lining up zero. Is that one for lining up zero appropriate in this case? Because it's sitting right on the desk there. There's not really any uncertainty with me lining up zero. So maybe I should only have the one reading uncertainty of a quarter millimeter here. But you know, uncertainties are a judgment call. If you think it's appropriate to add that second reading uncertainty, then do so. So I'd have one reading uncertainty here. The other question is, do I have any physical uncertainty for this measurement? So is the edge of this kind of fuzzy? Not really. So it's probably appropriate to say that there's no physical uncertainty for this. So I would just have a reading uncertainty, possibly two. Then I'd come over here and do the same thing. Just take a measurement directly off the ruler and think about the uncertainties. So I'm going to have one reading uncertainty due to the ruler for sure. Maybe a second one for zero, if you think that's appropriate. And in my case, probably no physical uncertainty. Now, if, for example, you're using a table that's been inclined, so you propped up one edge of the table for your inclined plane, then maybe you will have some physical uncertainty. It depends on your setup. And the thing is that I don't really care how big your uncertainty is as long as it's accurate for the setup that you have and that you explain it to me completely. So explain all your different sources of uncertainty regardless of what they come from, and I'm going to be happy with that. So that gives me my value for height 1 and height 2, and again, I'll be subtracting these later to get the height of the inclined plane. The next thing I want to measure is the length here of the whole pad. So for this one, I line up my ruler, and my ruler's not long enough. So I'm going to actually mark this spot here, and then move my ruler and add those two measurements. So I wind up getting 30 plus 13.2. So my total length for the track would be 43.2 centimeters. Now we got to think about uncertainties though. So I'll have one reading uncertainty due to lining this up and a second one over here for taking the measurement. But I also had two reading uncertainties due to this position of the ruler. So in total, I'm going to have four reading uncertainties. So four times one quarter millimeter gives me one millimeter of reading uncertainty in total. And the next question is, do I have any sources of physical uncertainty? So for my setup, I'm going to assume that these edges are sharp enough that I don't have any physical uncertainty due to trying to estimate where the edge of the pad is. But, you know, I might have some physical uncertainty here just in terms of how accurately I was able to line it up. So I might add another half millimeter, plus or minus half a millimeter for that, 
or I might decide that it's not necessary. So uncertainties are always a judgment call. You decide what you think is appropriate. So those are the measurements that we need to get for our first theoretical value for the acceleration. But since we're here, let's also measure d, the distance that the cart travels. The distance that the cart travels is basically to this backstop from the top of the track. And I want to think carefully about how I'm doing that. So to get the end of the track lined up with the edge of the pad, I put my finger here, and then I rest the cart against my finger, and then I pinch this little screw. And that's how I'm holding it at the top of the track. At the bottom of the track, it bumps into this backstop, which is a little bit spongy, not very, but slightly. So to take the measurement, I just put my ruler on here, and I'm lucky in that it's almost exactly 30 centimeters, so I can do it with just one ruler. But now I want to think about uncertainties. So I'm going to, again, have reading uncertainty due to the ruler. Quarter millimeter here, another quarter millimeter here. So half a millimeter of reading uncertainty in total due to the ruler. But it probably is appropriate to put some physical uncertainty on this measurement. So like I said, the box is a little spongy. So I have to estimate how much is that moving when I push on it. And it doesn't look like it's moving by more than about a millimeter. So plus or minus half a millimeter would span that range. So I'm going to list half a millimeter of physical uncertainty due to the softness of the backstop. And the other source of physical uncertainty is up here. So I rest my finger here, I pinch that. How far off might I be about getting this thing consistently lined up with the top of the pad? Again, I just sort of make an estimate. I think I could be off by as much as a millimeter, maybe even two millimeters. So I'd use plus or minus half of that range, whatever I decided on, as my physical uncertainty for lining up the cart with the top of the pad. So half a millimeter due to reading uncertainty of the ruler, half a millimeter due to the softness of the backstop, and maybe another half a millimeter physical uncertainty, that was physical uncertainty too, due to lining up the cart at the top of the pad. And all of the rest of the measurements that we're going to take are going to be done with the program. So now I'll go back to the split screen. So now we're going to take our first set of data. So we take the cart and get it lined up with the beginning of the track. Click record, release it, click stop. And now we can use the magnifying glass to highlight the data that we're actually interested in. And I don't actually need the position graph anymore. So I'm going to turn that off down here. And I do want to expand the acceleration chart also. So we need to get three items of data off of this graph. We need to get the acceleration of the cart, we need to get the final velocity of the cart, and we also need to get the time that it took to travel the distance d. Now we get acceleration from our lower chart here, but I'm actually going to highlight the data up here on the upper chart. So I go to the histogram and I want to go from velocity equals zero up to the point where the cart hits the backstop. And if you look at this lower graph, you see that that's where I ended up. On the upper graph, there's still a little bit that looks like it's linear, like it should be part of the chart. But based on the lower one, we were actually having a massive deceleration at that point. So I think what's going on is that this last little piece here is when I hit the backstop, which is a little bit spongy. So it changed the slope, but not enough that I could actually see it on the upper graph. I can see it on the lower one. As I said, there's three things that we're going to need to get off of this chart, and I'll just warn you that you're going to do this exact measurement 10 times so that we can average our values together. So you should make a data table with three spaces in it for the three items of data that we're going to measure. So as I said, the first thing we measure is the acceleration, and that'll just be the average of these values down here on the lower chart, which is located here, and its uncertainty is right beside it. So that's our first data value. The second thing we want is the final velocity of the cart. That we're going to get off of this upper chart. First, I want to draw your attention right here in the corner. These two numbers here, they tell you the instantaneous values of the data. So if I move my mouse right here to the end of the highlighted data, those two little values there are telling you the instantaneous time and the instantaneous velocity of that point. That velocity value is the one that we want because that's our final velocity for the cart. Note, however, that it doesn't have an uncertainty on it. So what I recommend you do is highlight the smallest increment of data you can up here, and then see how much the velocity changes between those two points. So it goes from 0.62 meters per second up to 0.64 meters per second. So that's a difference of 0 0.02 between those two. So I would use half of that as my uncertainty. So I'd make my uncertainty 0 0.01 meters per second on the final velocity. And because we expect the final velocity to be the same for all 10 runs that we do, 
you're free to just use that as your uncertainty for all of the final velocities. So again, highlighting my data. The third thing we need to get off of these graphs is the total time it took the cart to go the distance d. And that's just the elapsed time that I've highlighted. So this distance horizontally is what I want. And the graph does give that to you. Both of them do. So this delta t on the top, that's the elapsed time for the section of data that I highlighted. And the bottom graph has it also. Again, however, you'll note that there is no uncertainty given for it, so we'll have to come up with an estimate for an uncertainty. Again, I recommend that you just highlight the tiniest section that you can, and then you go and look at your delta t again, and it says 0.01 seconds. So we're going to have plus or minus half of that as our uncertainty at one end, and plus or minus half of that as the uncertainty at the other end. So 2 times 1 half of 0.01 is just 0.01. So that'll be our uncertainty on the time it took the cart to go the distance d. And again, because we expect this time to roughly be the same for every run, you're welcome to use that uncertainty for all 10 runs. So having gotten one section of data, you can then click Reset. And I think I need to turn my cart back on again. And then you would do another run of data. So again, line it up at the top, click Record, release it, stop taking data, use the magnifying glass, to zoom in on something you're interested in on both of those graphs. Switch to histogram, and then you want to highlight from zero velocity up to the end of where the acceleration looks flat. And you'll get your three values off of these charts, and then you do it again. So you do 10 runs in total. Now, after you've taken all your data, there's a bunch of quantities that you're going to need to calculate. But you don't need to do them this week, because next week we're going to be learning about Excel, and then I'm going to have you do all of your calculations in Excel, a spreadsheet program, and then that's what gets handed in as part of your report, and I grade the Excel calculations. So you don't need to calculate anything by hand in your book. But one thing you are going to do this week is you're going to watch another video on how to propagate uncertainties through equations, and then I want you to work out algebraically, that is in symbols only, what the uncertainties will be on all of your final calculated values. But as I said, you don't need to put numbers into it this week because we will be doing these calculations in Excel next week.